Hello, everyone. We'll just wait a couple more minutes. Um, first call of the new year. So happy new year, everyone. Good Hi, morning. Hi. I have to run and grab my laptop charger. I didn't realize my laptop was so dead. I will be back in like 20 seconds. No worries. Hi, Shing. Happy New Year. Hi, Alex. Happy New Year. Well, such as it is with everything that's going on at the moment, but you know what I mean. Hello, Aruba. Happy New Year. Hi. Hello. I'll give it one more minute and then um, we'll have uh, Raffaele talk to talk through the amazing documents that he's started drafting. I say started drafting. There's like 20 pages there. It's it's pretty amazing. Hey, Raphael, good to hear from you again. Hello, hi Aaron. And uh, Alex, thank you for the kind words. Uh, <clears throat> I have uh, severe internet issues today, so I'm going to try to save my bandwidth. Uh, so I'm on the mobile phone for our audio, and but I don't know about the video, how long it's going to hold. <laughs> So uh, I'm going to try to share my document when we start, but uh, it may, the connection may break. That's all right. I think um, yeah. I will put the, the link to the document in the chat window so um, people can all access it directly anyway. Okay. All right, it's it's six minutes past. Um, why don't we why don't we start? So, um, at the beginning of December, we um, for context at the beginning of December, we we had a discussion with Raffaele, and we 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 decided to, to take forward um, and build out some some more information on um, cloud native disaster recovery. Um, 
Rafaela has been exceptionally busy and has put together um, uh, a great a great document. I, th I think we were <laughs> we were expecting um, a, a skeleton that we could uh, that we could fill out, but but uh, there is a, a tremendous amount of content here. So so maybe Rafaela, do you want to take us um, through the document and um, and we can and we can kind of discuss and, and figure out what uh, what needs to be done and where you need help, etc. Sure. And is there a way for me to share my screen? I may not have permission to do it. Or at least I don't see. Oh, OK, found it, found it. Um, cool. OK. All right, so. Somewhere here. Okay. Okay. So yeah, um, like like Alex said, um, in the last meeting we decided to go ahead with uh, talking about disaster recovery in a cloud native scenario, and I was um, tasked to create a an outline of the document. But I decided to go ahead and also fill up some of the content. Uh, because I already had some of it written down in various articles that I had, um, you know, published before, and some of that was in my mind. So I just wanted to do a brain dump while it was there. And uh, so this is what I have. Obviously, it's a draft. Uh, it's draft in many ways, both in the structure and in the actual content. And so my hope is today to talk about it a little bit and then that you you all will go uh and and uh uh and I think the connection already dropped. So maybe someone else can share the can share this uh let me try again. Uh but can, can you still I hear can, me? We we can still hear you. Okay, good. So yes and um my hope is that you will all read it and provide feedback. Okay. Uh, do you all have commenter and uh, anyone? I, I don't know how to share it with, with everyone in this, um, in this SIG, but uh, as you ask permission to access, I will share it with you. And, uh, and, uh, um, uh, will give you commenter ability, so you you will be able to the, add the suggestions or comments. And if you would like to add your feedback that way, I will incorporate all of the feedback that makes immediate sense to me, and then discuss and follow up with you and discuss all of the feedback that um, you know for me is not clear. And then I, if we can work that way. So meaning directly on the document without having to need, I think we can quickly converge to something that we all agree and we all, we all feel like we can share. So for that, that, that is good. for how, yeah, how I would like to collaborate. Now the, on the document, I know, I know I can't share, but hopefully you can follow it. Uh, just follow on the, on the left side. Uh, let's let's take a look at the structure. <clears throat> so there there are three main uh, areas. One is the first the first chapter is about it, availability and to, consistency. Do you want me to share the document on my screen, if that would help? Yeah, go ahead and share, but I won't be able to see. <laughs> what sharing. Okay. So let me let me try to connect again. Maybe I will. But yeah, it's really bad. I don't know. I don't know what's going on today. Okay, thank you. Yes. So the first chapter is about availability and consistency. And here is we I'm trying to give some definitions about this concept plus others that will be useful later in the document and are, are relevant in the context of disaster recovery. So we talk about failure domain, right? Um, and then we talk about availability, consistency, the CAP theorem, which creates this relation between availability and consistency, right? And then uh, what we mean by disaster recovery. 
so for me and and you will read it in the document but the the main takeaway is that when we talk about availability we are really asking the question given in a a failure domain what happens to my workload if if one component in that failure domain fails one or or more but generally it's one right it's a ha of one instead when we talk about disaster recovery we're asking the question given an available um, given a failure domain what happens if all of the components fail at the same time with a single event right obviously in that case to, to be still uh, uh, able to service request you will need to have multiple failure domains so it's really it's a different question and but today there is a lot of confusion i think in, in my discussion at least what i've noticed in my discussion with my customers they tend to overlap the concepts because there is an expectation that disaster recovery behaves like ha in the sense that there is no service discontinuity right um, which is what we're trying to propose with this document. We're trying to create a guideline on how to reach that level of service, but but still it is, I think, important to keep those two concepts separated. Hey, Raffaele, so um, yeah. um, quick question therefore. Do we want do we want to um, do we want to put a definition of the R in there and in, in in some form and you know Yeah, there, there is. There is a, in the because you know one 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 of, one, one of the things one of, and let me explain what, why I'm trying to 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 discuss this about the dif the differentiation I guess between high availability and and you know disaster recovery because I think one of the um, one of the aspects the way we're we're kind of describing it in this document is that we are we are talking about multiple instances of of something right say you know a database or 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 or, or something that or or some sort of system or whatever it is that 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 we're thinking about here um and you know the 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 thing that's not 100% clear in my mind is where how blurry does that line get between ha and the R when we're when we're considering um, certain uh, cloud native technologies, right? So, so I'm kind of thinking if if we're talking about um, something like uh, you know Vitess or or CockroachDB or 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 something like that, where you you kind of have multiple instances and 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 replication, but the the those multiple instances are serving both the purpose of HA but also the purposes of the R right I guess there 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 might be lots of opportunities where there might be overlaps as well. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm. That's what I meant when I said I talk to customers where that are sort of overlapping those two concepts. Um, in the same way that you are describing, I, I, I'm building an architecture that serves both the purpose of local HA and global DR, you know, automatic DR. Uh, and then, and yes, yeah, so I can, with a single solution, I can address those two problems. But for me, they're still two separate problems. We can, however, we can add, and I've debated within myself whether we should do it or not. We can add a discussion in this document saying where where we see that possible overlap and and how, how that plays out. But right now I am the way this document is written right now, we we try to delineate a clear distinction between HA and DR. And for me the simple way, way to explain that distinction is that question you, you, the way you ask that question, right? Relative to a failure domain. HA is asking the question, what happens if one component fails? Anyone, right? And and then instead DR is asking the question, what happens if all of the components in that failure domain fail? Fail. So in that way you have a clear distinction. And the only way <laughs> the only really the only way where you start making the, the, 
they may mean the same thing, HA and NDR, is, is if you are uh, working with different failure domains. So, for example, let's say you have you have three geographies and, and instances of a workload in those geographies. When you ask the question about DR, you're, you're assuming that everything in one geography will fail. So your failure domain is a geography. But when you ask the question about, and when you try to ask the same question and you call it, and you call it HA, what you're really doing is you're saying, I consider my failure domain, the three geographies together, and I want to know what happens when one geography fails. Well, in that case, HA and DR can mean the same thing, but, but, but you have subtly changed the, the failure domain level. And I, I hope I'm not confused <laughs> everyone, but uh, that's what happens really in the, in the minds of, of, the, of the customers that, that I talk to sometimes. So if I may make a suggestion, Raphael, maybe it would make more sense to take that section on disaster recovery and move it up above HA so we address it first and then when we dive into talking about HA, we can talk about the correlation and non-correlation and differences between, you know, traditional ways that customers view these things compared to the cloud native approach, kind of like we did in the white paper, Alex. Because um, then, I mean, the, I think what's confusing is it's called cloud native disaster recovery, but it's the last piece of this. Maybe it's just reordering will make more sense to get what you're trying to get at across Alex. Does that make more sense? Because it brings the definition up to the start of the document. That's the stage. Yeah. Um, yeah, in the so in the disaster recovery section that is highlighted right now, it, we just talk about general disaster recovery definitions. It's not the solution for cloud native disaster recovery that is only at the end but i can move the disaster. yeah we can move we can rearrange the disaster recovery se section and definition section and put it just before or right after the high availability one and uh, so so people mm -hmm. can mentally compare them immediately uh, yeah. and i think I it's a good suggestion yeah i think that that makes sense too i guess for me, the the um, you know, I, I think describing it in terms of working across um, failure domains is um, is 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 a is a good way of doing it. Um, the second distinction, which I wanted to clarify, because because this is kind of important too, is are we are we talking about um, are we talking about systems where, so actually let, let me take a step back because I'm, I'm not articulating this particularly well. So in, in a more traditional um, DR kind of hypothesis, right, we, we would be talking about having completely separate instances of, of, a, of a system, you know, whatever that system is, whether it's an application, a database, whatever. Um, and they would, and 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 those systems would be, um, uh, would be made available across different failure domains, and 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 the, those failure domains could be data centers, they could be racks, they could be server rooms, they could be geographies, whatever that those failure domains are, um, and that makes kind of like a lot of sense. But I think what we're seeing in 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 the cloud native world, um, and and this is why I'm I'm, I'm mentioning it is. That what we're seeing is um, the the spread of components across failure domains to 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 effectively um, you know have much more of an overlap between HA and DR and and you know for me that that is that is also kind of like an important differentiation so so if the definition of DR is being able to to recover um, a system um, from the failure of or, or from the outage of a failure domain, right? The the D 
the other differentiator, which which might need clarification, is are we talking about completely separate instances, or are we talking about, or can we also talk about a single instance that has components which are spread across failure domains? I don't know what it means to to say a single instance that has components right. spread so, across failure domains because those are multiple instances for me of of that uh, single initial entity, whatever whatever that was. Okay. All right. So, right? so so let me try and explain. Let, let me try and explain. So so imagine you have imagine you have a database, um, mm -hmm. and um, and your database and your database has maybe a primary and, 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 and a replica copy, right? And and those primary and replica copies are spread out across um, uh, different failure domains, right? But but from a management point of view, from a control plane point of view, they're being administered as a, as a single instance. They just have two components, a primary and a replica which are spread across um, different failure domains, right? That oh. is, that is, that is, um, you know, that is different from perhaps say an environment where you have two separate database instances and you're using some sort of process, for example, to keep transactions in sync or, or, or you know, you're doing some storage level replication or, or database level replication, but they are two completely separate instances and managed separately, right? You see what I'm trying to get at? It, uh, it, 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 the, the, the difference being that the management layer is, is seeing it as one instance or as multiple instances. So, for example, in the first example, where where you have you know a primary and a replica, and they're tightly coupled and and, and seen as one instance, um, a configuration error or an error on one side can easily cascade down to the replica, right? Whereas if they are two completely separate instances, you have you have like separation of those domains of those failure domains. Okay, I think I followed, but um, now help me understand how you want to, because we can, you know, each each workload. There are ton of, tons of states of workload, and they all have uh, quirks in the way you can configure them and options. That not not, like, not say quirks, but options. So what you have described is maybe an option of some kind of workloads, but um, how do we generalize that um, because we don't want you know in, with um, at least I was trying to be very general with these concepts and yes yeah there are there are some databases that can do master slave right and or workloads that can do master slave and uh, um, and you know it, it would be wise for you to put the master and the slave in different failure domains but I'm not sure how that comes back into this document. How, how would you, 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 are you meaning, are you saying that this could be a way to do HA and, and then having, having a separate control, a separate, completely separate instance is the way to do DR? Is that, is that where we're going? Well, so, so what I was, so what I was thinking was um, that I'm I'm seeing you know in 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 customers that we're working with I'm I'm kind of seeing two specific patterns emerge. So imagine you have um, imagine you have a storage system for the sake of the argument, right? I am seeing two specific patterns. The first pattern is that a customer is installing two separate storage systems one in each failure domain and is using some sort of technology to 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 replicate data or, or to make the data available across those two separate systems right um, and if a failure domain um, uh, has an outage then the second system is completely independent and, and functions as a separate unit but i'm also seeing 
a second pattern where they're installing one storage system, but it just happens that that storage system is, for example, spread out over multiple failure domains. So for example, you know, a storage system that can do replicas or erasure coding or, or something like that, but it's actually just spread across multiple, um, multiple uh, failure domains. So, so, so now you have kind of like a single instance across multiple failure domains versus mm -hmm. multiple instances over multiple failure domains. So, so I, I was kind of I was kind of um, bringing this up because what I'm seeing is a lot of the a lot of the cloud native um, um, uh, technologies, you know, and I'll mention, for example, you know, Rook and Ceph and 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 Vitesse, for example. Um, tends to favor um, a single instance spread out over multiple failure domains. Whereas yeah. um, other technologies, you know, like, uh, and I'll give, say, Postgres as an example, you, you kind of see that as being implemented as multiple instances over multiple failure domains. And it is, it is subtly okay. different, but, you know, no, I agree. I agree. I am um, so in this document. I am focusing on on the single logical instance, single logical workload entity spread across multiple failure domains. Uh, the other one, the other option, maybe I need to understand more. But but I think it's yeah. Um, I'm not sure. Exactly, how to model that. But but if we if we feel we should talk about the other option, I'm I'm certainly open to it. It is it is in a way in the appendix, but I think you you have a more comprehensive view of the other option. <clears throat> but for me, in this document, I'm always I'm always in all all the examples that I'm thinking about. There is a logical entity, and we just discuss how to make it highly available. Uh, and and resistant to disasters, but it's not it's not about keeping in sync multiple entities. Um, Got it. Or well, or, unless you go to the traditional disaster recovery strategies, which is well, all of them are doing that, are trying to do that. But in the cloud native, we, I think our at least my argument is you should pick a software uh, or a product that. Um, can do that. Um, that that is is you can deploy as a single logical entity, and it will spread across multiple failure domains. And that the, the question obviously becomes how far you can go with the failure domains. Like, can you do geographies, or is it just local? Because some some of these workloads have latency issues, but. But yes, that's uh, that's the thesis right now of the document. That's where the document is going. So we can we can obviously rediscuss if that is what we want to say. But uh, that's what it, the document is saying. Raphael, now. Raphael, I had a yeah. question about scope of disaster. So um, I think right now it looks like your disasters are uh, a benign faults as opposed to malicious attacks. Is that correct? But the, right now, the definition of disaster is everything that is in a failure domain becomes unavailable for a single event. So there is yeah, some event so just... specified that takes out the failure domain. And, and you choose what the failure domain is, but generally speaking, it's considered, in, when you talk about disaster, uh, people immediately think the data center is the failure domain. Yeah, so I guess I'm looking at uh, security compromise as a disaster, uh, pot it, it either potentially in scope or out of scope of the paper, because your storage solution is one way to create resiliency against um, attacks. I, I, I think I need to understand that statement. That I, I, I think that's that's a good point, right? Where 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 you know um, 
somebody might use um, DR capabilities to protect against um, a security issue or to protect against, um, or even to protect, say, against human error, for example, I imagine, right? Yeah, yeah, so, and I have customers that do that, but but we, you know, when, when when you do a theoretical approach to these kind of issues, it doesn't matter why the disaster came to be, right? You, you could have a, a virus that spreads across a data center, or you could have some proof that somebody is compromising, compromising your DMZ in a data center, but not in the other, and then you shut down the data center. It doesn't matter why. The point is, at some point, we lose connectivity, and that's really what we what our software should be able to detect and react to if we want to do cloud native disaster recovery meaning the application as soon as connectivity is lost to the other peers right of this cluster of logical workload the, that workload is able to reorganize itself and keep working and keep serving without human intervention So, I mean, I'm totally fine if we want to list example of disasters and have a security in it, but it doesn't change the rest. Of, it shouldn't change the rest of the conversation, right? It's the trigger of the disaster shouldn't change how we manage the disaster. And tell me if I'm, you know, if you disagree. I, I think Alex's one instance versus two instances kind of highlight that. It, it, to some degree in my mind that a disaster in a single instance uh, it, it is it is different than a disaster with independence um, with more layers of independence and yeah, that independence that, could that, be in the journaling or, or or other security keys or or different aspects of the storage subsystem That, but, but I mean, that, 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 that is... be careful there. I'll be careful there because Sorry. if you set up a multiple instance, multiple logical instance kind of scenario, and you want really fast recovery from a disaster, it means that you're synchronizing the data, right? Very continuously, synchronously, maybe, or mm -hmm. asynchronously, but with, with a very little delay. And then, so if your fear is my data was compromised by an, an actor and I, I'm now switching to the other side where my data was not compromised, then that's, that conflict with the requirement of ever, having very timely synchronization. So, so, and that's the only thing that is being synchronized anyway with a single instance data is the only thing that is being synchronized between these instances anyway, when you have the log single logical instance. So the risk that you're running, I would say, is, is pretty much the same. Makes sense? I think a, I think attacks are an interesting concept, but um, it could be a rabbit hole if you, if you get into like a sophisticated enough attack that can poison disaster recovery, you know, how, to, how do you protect disaster recovery itself? Um, I don't, I don't know if that's the scope of this document or not, but I, I could see that being a, an important topic. Well, I'm, I'm I, taking note of this anyway, because I want to listen about it, but, um, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll provide, I'll provide some, I'll, I'll provide some feedback to the, to, to the document. I mean, security is an interesting angle. What, one of the, the. The specific angle, actually, I was I was thinking of between the multiple instance versus single instance, is is also you know more simple things like like human error, for example, right? So so for example, if you if 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 you are um, replicating say transaction logs across two different instances on a database, um, then if somebody makes a mistake on on the primary and say drops a table. The, the the drop doesn't have to get replicated, for example. Whereas, you know, if you're if you're working with a single instance um, across multiple failure domains, a human error kind of takes out all the failure domains at the same time. 
um, so 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 those 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 were kind of like some of the things that that um, I was I was going to suggest that we highlight. So so we can we can just say, look, there are two ways of doing this: multiple instances with multiple domains, or a single instance with multiple domains. And there are some pros and cons between the both, and, and maybe have a short table. With, and so I can I can throw that together, and and we can review it for next time. Yeah. Uh, let's let's do the, white, let's do there's also a white paper by the uh, six security. Are there anything in that white paper that we can reference in the stock? So, Alex, I don't know if you reviewed the latest of the six yeah. paper. Yes, I. I'll I'll have a quick look and and see if there's something which we can which we can use there. Okay. I I propose let's uh, table this for now. The we both. Alex and I took note of that, so we will. It, the feedback is not going to be lost. Uh, let's uh, let's not use all the time on this. I want to talk about the other three sections of the document. Good points. Just briefly. Yeah. So so the first one, as we said, is about defining these concepts about availability, consistency, and disaster recovery, and all all the all the other reasonings that we need in the rest of the document. The second section is about describing stateful applications for the pieces that are needed for our discussions again. And, and the argument here is that all stateful applications, regardless of what they do, have to solve a difficult problem when they are distributed, and that is to keep the state in sync. So the argument of this section is, in, in the end, with regard to availability and consistency, all state applications are doing the same thing. Uh, that they, they have to solve the same problem. Maybe they solve it in different ways, but they are actually solving the same problem. And so we can model those stateful applications. We can create a logical model of those state of, of a stateful application that applies to all of them. Of course, when you actually build a stateful application that model doesn't hold because you have to optimize, <clears throat> highly optimize, right? But in, in the logical model is that there is an API layer. So that could be the SQL layer or it could be messaging layer. If it's a storage type of state of application is the block device protocol or the file system protocol. Right? It's, it's a way to talk to the application. And there is a coordination layer and then there is a storage layer, okay? this this Paragraph is kind of similar to what the storage SIG has already published, right? With with just the addition of the concept of the coordination layer, but the API layer and the storage layer were were already identified in that in that uh, document. And then I I'm, I'm adding here the concept of replicas and partitions, and it should be self-explanatory, but read read some of the considerations regarding replicas and partition. But replicas is is a way to obviously create HA, high availability for, for a workload, and partitions is a way to scale uh, by, by partitioning the data the data set, right? And then you can use them together to create a highly available and theoretically unlimited scaling workloads, which is what you know modern Modern products like CockroachDB and Yugabyte and um, TIDB, it's what they advertise that they can do. And you should try them. They can actually really do <laughs> that, at least, at least relative to the hardware that I have to my disposal. I can see that they actually scale uh, essentially linearly. They don't have performance loss because, because you create more replicas due to coordination. So anyway, going back to the structure here, um, so you have replicas and partition. And so if we go to the put, uh, to the last paragraph where, where I say putting it all together, uh, if you don't mind scrolling there, Alex, the idea is that you have these uh, instances of, of replicas that will be coordinated to stay always in sync. And then you have uh, other partition of the, of the data which may have multiple instances, right? And sometimes you have a uh, request that that requires uh, the cross cross partition type of request, in which case you have to coordinate between 
partitions. Okay, so so there are, the important thing here is the important takeaway is that we need two kinds of coordination protocols or consensus algorithm. One to coordination between partitions, uh, uh, one to coordinate between replicas, and one to coordinate between partition. And and the job is very different because between replicas, it's about doing the same thing. All the replicas have to do the same thing. Between partitions, it's about doing a different thing. Each each partition has to do a different uh, operation, right? Uh, to carry out the full transaction. Okay. Um, <clears throat> then, so that's important to understand. And the other thing is, unfortunately, there is a lot of confusion in the names that each workload uses for calling, you know, for the concept of replica and partition in their own jargon, in their own, you know, product. So uh, that's where I want to do some more research for this for this document and actually create a classification <clears throat> of all of all the common you know workloads and products and and show how you can map what they call uh, a partition what they call for example access search I think call index what would be in this document called a partition or and 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 uh, I mean you know, I map all of these to showcase that really all the workloads can be can be brought to this model that we are that we are talking about here. Um, then the, the third section is about the consensus protocol consensus protocols. It is similar to the section that was in the appendix in the in the original you know um, in the, in the Started SIG um, paper that was published, but it's a little bit expanded, um, and uh, and we here we we say I say that for for replicas coordination, the there are specific consensus protocols that might, that that fit better for that job, and they are Raft and Paxos, okay. So the, they are the, the uh, consensus protocols that are based on leader election and in which all of the instances that participate in that transaction essentially have to do the same thing based on a log of events, right? And then there is the consensus protocol uh, between partitions and, and, this, and that's where uh, two-phase commit and three-phase commit are better fit. And the other thing that we that I, I talk about in this in this section is uh, is the fact that you should only trust proved consensus protocols uh, algorithm. And then this some if you just scroll up a little bit, this concept of reliable replicate reliable replicated state uh, machine and the reliable reliable replicated um, data store. This is. Um, some excerpt taken from the SRE book. So very, very interesting reading, but the general, uh, the gist of it is that this problem can be generalized and has been theoretically solved by a set of paper um, in, in the academia where you can, they have proved that you can build a machine that will replicate the state whatever that means for your particular stateful workload in a reliable way across multiple replicas using using a leader election type of consensus protocol. And so they give you all the instructions, you know, they, they give you a mathematically proved way to do it. And uh, and in fact, so so this this I think this kind of layer in software will be at some point generalized um so that people can can more quickly build cloud native style of workloads where they just have to to define the api and the rest is already taken care to a, to a certain extent taken care but anyways this is just to make the point that um 
that it's possible theoretically to build this kind of workloads. Um, and at the end, uh, if you can scroll down a little bit, at the end there is a table where I have classified some of the workloads, common workloads that uh, stateful workload that uh, we that I that we encounter, and uh, they are classified by the uh, consensus protocol that they use to sync the replicas and then the consensus protocol that they use to sync the partition if they have a concept of partition, right? Because partition is not ne necessary, right? Uh, for example, ETCD does not support partitioning the data. So all of the copies in ETCD, they have the entire data space, right? But other 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 databases do, like when when you want to scale to a larger ability to manage the largest data set. So it's interesting because, I mean, at least I found this research interesting because it, it maps nicely all the theoretical concepts that we had talked before to actual workloads. Uh, even though they don't, it's hard to find this information, they don't advertise it, but this is, I think is a way to classify workload and put them all on the same level and rationalize their their own internal way of calling things, and it should immediately give you an idea of what the workload can do with respect to the problem at hand, right? So with respect to high availability and disaster recovery, it doesn't tell you what else, you know, what the what the API does, and we don't care about that. But we can we can immediately immediately see that um, what what we can expect in terms of behavior. When we when we want to set up an highly available deployment of these workloads, then um, so that that concludes the consensus protocol section, and then the last section is where we essentially give our proposal of what a cloud native disaster recovery strategy should look like. Okay, so I expect here we will, we will discuss a lot, for a long time, but my proposal is that one should pick a workload that can be spread across multiple availability zones as a single logical entity. And then uh, and then let it do its job, right? It, it's gonna be, have to be written to work with the concept of CAP and to have the concept of for sure copies and maybe even partitions, right? And then the idea is when the work, when in this picture, when a data center goes down, you will have some level of global traffic manager that detects that and doesn't send traffic to the data center that went down and will send the, the traffic to the remaining data centers. And then you will, and then the workload will self reorganize and will keep serving requests. So, the, so what we want to be able to say is in my opinion, is the right way in cloud native scenarios to do disaster recovery is to try to achieve zero RPO and zero RTO, which means zero data loss during a disaster, that is RPO, and zero downtime during a disaster, and that is RTO. And so the, here there are some <clears throat> very high level, so there is a high level architecture now now this should look like right and then there is some high level considerations on how to do this with uh, with kubernetes so if you scroll down there are some some consideration and my conclusion is that to achieve this kind of capabilities zero rpo and zero rto and keep in mind the traditional enterprise they dream Traditional enterprises, they dream about having zero RPO, zero RTO. For them, disaster recovery is an incredible pain, which means that they have to do, they, they, they cannot treat disaster recovery as an HA event, right? It, disaster recovery is a human decision, it's not autonomously managed by the system. It's a human decision that there is a disaster and then a lot of manual processes have to take place 
they have to do uh, exercises every six months, I think, those that actually do those exercises, and they're very, very painful. Here we are, we are telling them there is a new way to do these kind of things. You need three data centers and you need workloads that can be deployed that way. But then if you do that, you get that disasters are managed as HA events, essentially, and that are, they are, the reaction is, the reaction to a disaster is, is managed by the system autonomously. You don't have to do anything. There is no manual intervention. And there is no manual intervention also to, you know, what it's also very painful for them when the when the data center that were that was lost, when the data center that was lost comes back up, restoring everything to the right, uh, to the normal to normal operation is as painful as as managing the disaster sometimes. In this case, there is no human intervention when the disaster happens, there's no human intervention when the data center comes back up. So it's a very, very desirable situation to be, right? Uh, and that's, that's, in my opinion, that should be our case, is that we propose people to do things this new way if they're trying to do cloud native, uh, cloud native, a cloud native approach to disaster recovery. And, and, and the surprising thing for me here, the surprising discovery is Disaster recovery is often very much associated with storage. People assume that the solution to disaster recovery will come from storage. In this case, <clears throat> really, the solution, the, the capabilities uh, that we need are in part of the, the state of workload, okay? It has to be built that way. In, it has to be able to be deployed in that way. But then the, the other capabilities that we need are really capabilities that come from networking, more than storage. I, I found it. I found that insight interesting, so I'm sharing it. Um, well, I'll stop for a second just to see if you had uh, shared input here. Uh, but, I mean, um, I I like where this is going, but but I think one one sort of thing that did ring alarm bells is kind of you know recommending that cloud native is has zero RPO and zero RTO. I mean that that is that is a very big statement. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think yeah, that, that, I, I, that, I was that, expecting that, some. That that might yeah. need some discussion just 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 because of the, just because of the you know the typical expense of doing that and and, and you know, the RTO and the RPO, are not necessarily, like, the more cloud native you are, the more you know technically you're able to achieve, zero RTO and RPO, but that doesn't necessarily mean mean that you need to do that or that in fact it is right for you right because that's also arguably the absolute most expensive solution it it is going to cost you a lot more to do that so totally agree that that is the traditional uh let's say law that the more the more you want to achieve the the more expensive it is. I'm. I'm challenging if that is still true with with these new technologies. I think it's more expensive, but not extremely more expensive. But still, I agree with your argument. Um, we should not say that in cloud native you can only do it this way. And that's. It's, I, I'm actually trying to say it that way. I'm trying to say with cloud native you can aim to zero RPO and zero RTO, and this is how you would do it. But there are other options. Right, and in fact, in the appendix, I'm listing the other options. So, if you if you don't mind, Alex, scrolling to the appendix, uh, sure. but it may need some rewarding. I agree with you; it may need some rewarding. But the other op in the appendix, I'm discussing other options, right? That, which I call the more traditional disaster recovery options. And, and the point here is, 
playing the game may need some rewarding. But the point here is, you can still, even if you, even you know, even if in container native uh, or cloud native, you can still do the disaster recovery approaches that you're probably likely doing today, right, in your traditional data center or pre-cloud data center. And here is what they look like, and here is some considerations on how to implement them in cloud native, and uh, there is some some specific consideration on Kubernetes. Um, but my, yeah. so, so they're still absolutely possible, right? But I would like, I would like our document to say, but still, we we prefer, we think you could you could achieve zero RPO and zero RPO, and that is that would be the democratization of this high level, you know, high performing way of doing disaster recovery. Well, I understand what you're trying to say, but but I I still strongly feel that what we're saying is the cloud native technologies enables you to achieve that in in ways that you know were 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 previously very hard to do um uh with with i guess traditional disaster recovery strategies but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm 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 struggling to say that to, to that we should say that's the only way of doing it or that's the recommended way of doing it because you know we're 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 specifically open to different options for different requirements in the in the storage white paper so for example you know things like eventual consistencies um in in data systems for example are are perfectly reasonable compromises to make for if you want performance for example um but mm -hmm. eventual consistency also means that you know z zero rpo is impossible but but that's fine because you know people can make these compromises and, and we kind of discuss those different options and those different attributes in the white paper so so I, I think we need to we need to be careful not to not to kind of present this as this is the only thing that you can do or, or this is the only thing that you should be doing because because i think that that would be problematic i am with you i am with you totally so um i agree and if the words don't come across that way we can certainly fix them um yeah, we can we can change from we recommend this to 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 something like the new with the, this new cloud native technologies. This is now enabled, and it's possible, and you would do it this way. But also, all the other options are still available. I'm totally fine with yep. changing that. It should be. It's either way, it should be so compelling if you to to try to do RPO and RTO, and it's so relatively easy now that I think we're going to achieve the same effect, which is, in my opinion, is that push people to start using these new approaches. I agree. I agree. That makes sense. Well, okay. we've so can hit, I give you a to do? Yeah, can I, Alex? Can I give you to do to read those um, final section and see if the we need some rewarding? Definitely. Yeah, I will. I will provide some feedback over the next few days. Perfect. Um, and and, and the, the thank you so much also for for. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for all the work that you've put into this, and 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 you know just echoing what Rafael just said. Um, Please provide, uh, please provide feedback. That that would be great. Excellent. Well, thanks right. everyone for for um, for joining the call, um, and I look forward to the to the next set of updates and the next and the next meeting. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye.